Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis, support.greatdetectives.net, and you can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month by just going to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of The Adventures of Sam Spade. The original air date, April 20th, 1951, and the title is The Rowdy Dowser Caper. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Detective Agency. Hello, hello, hello. Sam? At this hour on this network, you were expecting maybe Mary Margaret McBride? I've been expecting anything, Sam. Well, After all, to have you drop out of sight like that, leaving not a, a ripple on the surface for four whole days. Mr. Livingstone is frantic. Who? Mr. Livingstone, the man you rented the car from, he's, he, he's ready to send out a search party. Aha! Uh-huh. Sammy and Livingstone with a reverse twist. It's no joke, Sam. Nothing, huh? You you have no right to worry me like this. It's not fair. Where are you? To the only spot on Earth as yet unvisited by the National Geographic Society, sweetheart, the Vale of Takaloma. And don't try to find it on a map because it isn't. Set yourself for my saga of a crook's tour of the hinterlands with just a touch of mysticism which is why I call it the Rowdy Dowser Caper. All right, Murgatroyd, these will do. Sam, where are you calling from? A tailor shop. I had to leave without my pants. For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all, starring Stephen Dunn in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Dum da da dum dum dum. When you and I were young, Effie. Sam. Who else? Are you decent? Decent? Well, you said you'd lost your pants, so. Oh. Yeah. How do they look? Well. Isn't it a little early for Halloween? Ooh, you made a joke. You ready, woman? As always, Sam. They fill it in to Constable Ollie Shuttle, North Takaloma, California. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Rowdy Dowser Caper. Dear Ollie. On Wednesday it was when I returned to my office of a fine spring morning to find a note lying on my desk like a big juicy piece of cheese in a mousetrap. Quote, Mr. Spade, call North Taka... Takaloma? Three. Unquote. Hmm, North Takaloma. Where have I... Long distance. North Takaloma, three. Yes, sir. One moment. Uh, would you repeat the number, please? North Takaloma, three. North Takaloma, three. Nice diction. That is North Takaloma? I'm not kidding. Look it up, girl. Look it up. Yes, sir. North Takaloma, three. Well, she must have found it in the book because soon we had encouraging buzzes and clicks. Six operators later, we had punched our way north to the farm at Slattery Flat. Then we knocked off for lunch while Slim Slattery repaired the windmill that made the juice for the last lap. At 2.07 p.m., victory was in sight. Yeah? 
Sam, this is Operator Nyan for the tenth time. Oh, fine. Uh, How we doing, Millie? Sam, boy, I am actually ringing North Tacoloma City. Oh, good girl. Hello? Hello, this is Sam Spade. I have a note here to oh, call... Oh, yes, North... yes, Mr. Spade. You were out of town when I came. Perhaps you remember me? Uh... Wendell Wisby of Oak Tree Lane, North Tacoloma, California. Wendell? I employed you a year ago to find a girl who vanished. The magician! You made the girl disappear and couldn't bring her back. Uh, correct. Yeah. You may well ask, Mr. Spade, how anything could be worse than that. Well, this... This is... <laughs> Oh, there, Wendell. There, boy. Take it easy. I, I can't talk. I, I just can't talk about it. Fine, fine. Then write me a nice, long letter. Uh, well, you know, I'd this rather... is a long-distance call, and I... No, no, I... no, no, no. I, I am sorry, Mr. Spade, but this has affected me very deeply. Look, you promised you'd lay off the magic, Wendell. Well, What'd you I... do? Misplace half a woman this time? No, I have given up magic, Mr. Spade. I am currently employed as third vice president of the Second National Bank of North Tacoloma. All that? Yes, sir. Oh, my star was rising. My future seemed assured, but now a shadow has fallen over my good name. Boot it along, will you, Wendell? This is costing me money. I cannot tell you more on the phone, Mr. Spade. You must come at once. It is extremely urgent. I see. Well, frankly, Wendell, I have a feeling I'll be tied up. But I left There's your a retainer under I have your to desk, make, and, Well, the chances are I'll... What was that? I just said there's a hundred dollars under your desk blotter for a retainer. I left it when I came with a note. But if, if you have a collection to make, suppose Oh, uh, I... Wendell, that is the collection. And so it befell that shortly before lunch on the following day, I guided my rented hack across the ford at Clobber Creek, up the high road through Possum Notch, and down into the Vale of Tacoloma, where I muscled my way through a flock of geese in the main street and tied up before the imposing stone facade of the Second National Bank. Inside, sitting in front of the door marked Urban Root President, sat a secretary whose facade looked colder and even more imposing than the bank's. She was shriveling one of the customers, a meek little milk toast in a salt and pepper soup. As I informed you, my good man, President Root is extremely tied up at the moment. Oh, I'm quite aware of that, miss. I wouldn't bother him for the world, but you see, uh, I... No, would... I don't see. I... And since you refuse to state the nature of your business... Did I, I refuse? You most certainly oh, did. Oh, dear me, I didn't mean to refuse anything. It's just that, well, it's sort of personal, and uh, may I go in? You may sit down until I tell you to go in. Is that clear? Uh, yes, ma'am, yes, I don't... I... I understand. I don't mind waiting. Don't mind at all. <clears throat> uh, and now you, sir. What do you want? I have an appointment with Wendell Wisby. Uh, Mr. Wisby is in conference with the President Root. Thanks. Sir. If you'll sit down, I'll... Uh, just a minute, sir. Uh, just a minute. And you must understand, President Root, this is a matter of family honor. Yes. I shall... Do... Oh, hi, Wendell. Oh, Mr. Spade. Now, sorry I couldn't get here sooner, but it's a long haul. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Spade is a friend of mine, President Root, from my solid days as a magician. A very competent detective, I might add. Well, thank you, Wendell. Hey, I see. We, uh, we are indeed fortunate to have him with us in this matter. Good, good. Uh, please sit down, Mr. Spade. Thanks. Uh, you are aware, Mr. Spade, this matter is to be held in strictest confidence. Word must be kept from the depositors at all costs until... But remember, yeah. President Root, eh? remember the code of the Wisbys. Should worse come to worst, I shall make good. I shall make good if it takes I me... I understand, Wisby. I understand. Well, mind if I admit I don't? What is it, Wendell? Snatcher. Snatch whom? Uncle Purse. Our former cashier, Mr. Speed. Purse Snatcher. Wisby's uncle. Purse Snatcher. What about him? Everything. He has disappeared. Absconded. That is a harsh word, President Root. I would prefer to say he disappeared until we have further proof. The money's gone, isn't it? How much money? $53,000. From Uncle Purse's accounts. Yeah. It may be he has absconded, President Root, but we must remember that despite the snatcher surname, Uncle Purse is a Wisby. And a Wisby never lived who got away with $53,000. All right, Wisby. He disappeared. Yes, may I ask when he disappeared? Last Friday night, about nine o'clock. Anyone see him go? Almost everyone. His car stalled at Main and Persimmon. Several people saw him trying to start it. Oh. He was acting very strangely. Oh, how was that, Wendell? Well, uh, Clem Clobber huh? and, and Charity Fid and, and several others spoke to him from the curb, but he wouldn't answer them. He didn't say a word to anyone, which is not at all like Uncle Purse Snatcher. 
Wisby, man to man, would you feel sociable with a satchel full of stolen money on the seat beside you? Well, there you have a point, President Root. I can't blame you for the way you feel, President Root. But I must continue to believe the best of Uncle Purse until Mr. Spade discovers the worst. Oh. <laughs> and in that dismal eventuality, please know I intend to pay off the $53,000 plus interest on the installment plan. $5.37 per week for 48 years. Oh. You have my word on it, sir. The word of a Wisby. With which solemn pronouncement, Wendell marched out, closely followed by me. Salt and pepper suit milk toast was still fingering his hat rim, looking hopefully at Miss Icewater for the sign. At Wendell's suggestion, I hustled out to the Snatcher homestead for a word with Percy's wife, a timid little woman with her heart in her eyes, known from one end of the valley to the other as Aunt Wistful. I can hardly think straight these days, Mr. Spade. So full of puzzlement, this thing has left me. Of course, Aunt Wistful. <laughs> Have another dipper of cider, Mr. Spade. Oh, get down, not you. No, thanks, Aunt Wistful. First wasn't himself since the well run dry. We had a passel of dry winters here in the valley, you know, but never for this has the well run dry. First didn't know which way to turn. The pipe ends two miles down the road. Couldn't afford to bring it in here. I see. He took to muttering to himself, saying strange things. Coming home from his work at the bank with a frown on his face. Stayed there all evening. What do you mean, strange things? Oh, I don't recollect very well. He brought a law book home one night, though, and out of a clear sky, he says to me, Wistful, honey, do you know the punishment for embezzlement is five to ten years in prison? I asked what he meant by that, and he said he thought it might be a good thing for a banker to know. Well, he had something there. It was the night after that. He come home all cheerful. He said he thought he'd figured a way out. Found a fellow to help him. <laughs> Get down. I had no idea what Purse was thinking. Uh, what fellow? Urban Root, I suppose. Oh, Urban. It's Urban's bank he was fixing to steal from. Mm -hmm. But then I got word from my sister ailing over to Fogarty Grove, so oh. Thursday I left, and when I got back Saturday, he'd gone. Now, did he take his things? Mostly. Funny. He did one strange thing for this time of year. He left his corn teeth behind. Corn teeth? Huh? Mm -hmm. A spare pair of store teeth for corn on the cob. Oh. The purse will miss him now with summer coming on. Yes, yes Bless him. You know, ever since spring, I've been after purse to spade up my flower bed by the window. Mm. <laughs> he did it before he left, now that there's no water to grow things with. I loved him so much, Mr. Spade. In this awful way for marriage to him. Get down! Well, I started at Main and Persimmon Streets and worked south, farm by farm. Everyone seemed to have been sitting on his front stoop Friday night because all remembered Purse Snatcher driving out on the south road in his 1919 Winton 6. Up to a point, that is. Somewhere between North Tacoloma and Fogarty Grove, I ran out of witnesses. And in Piney Crotch, of all places, the town beyond, they could guarantee Purse didn't pass through because the main drag was roped off all Friday night for a square dance. And thus, matters stood on the third day when I limped back to the bank. For some reason, a crowd had gathered in the alleyway next door. Writing it off as a floating crap game, I walked inside, bowed formally to Miss Icewater, then plunked myself down at Wendell's desk. Oh, Shaw. Uh, I just found I miscalculated on the interest. At $5.37 per week, I won't have this paid off until I'm 134. And who knows? By then, you may even have a wife and children to support. Look, don't you think you were a little impetuous with that retainer? What retainer? Mine, the hundred dollars. Hundred dollars? Wendell, the hundred dollars you stuck under my desk blotter when you hired me. 
I hired you? You came to my office while I was out of town, Wendell. You left a note for me to call you. I talked to you on the telephone. Well, didn't I? Mr. Spade, something is very wrong. I did not talk to you on the telephone at all. What? I, I thought you were employed by President Root. Well, where is President Root? I don't know. He stepped out some time ago, and there's someone waiting for him in his office. Oh? Do, 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 do. Hi, Miss Icewater. Oh, tell me, pretty mean. Are there any more at home like you? Well, <laughs> no <Nope>. toast. <laughs> But with a difference, the salt and pepper suit had gone. Beret, bow tie, plaid sport jacket with a racing form sticking out of the pocket. Maroon plus fours and wool socks with tassels. He took one of President Root's cigars out of his pocket, bit off the end, and lit it. Then smiled, or rather leered, at Miss Ice Water. <laughs> well, honey. I'm sorry, oh, sir. Oh, 23 skidoo, sweet stuff. President Root will be back shortly if you... <laughs> Oh, don't be a back number, beautiful. But, sir, I... Ah, 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 Papa love Mama. Well, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> You'll learn. <laughs> Tell Cookie I'll be back, huh? Oh, yes, sir. Anything you say. Live a little, baby. Live a little. <laughs> Toodaloo. <laughs> Golly. Golly, indeed. Uh, Miss Icewater. Hey. Oh. What? Was that? Uh, I don't know his name. A friend of Peasant Roots. Uh, he, uh, he's rather attractive, don't you think? <laughs> Only now, as I went outside in his wake, did I see what had caused the crowd in the alleyway. The first sport model convertible in Tolokoma Valley since Wally Reed came through on location. And the first pink one I'd ever seen. <laughs> Pondering the new milk post, I walked into the drugstore, found a phone book, and checked all 25 names. North Takaloma 3 belonged to the Atomic Auto Courts and Restaurant, Charity Fid, proprietress. She was riding herd on a griddle full of lamb chops when I pulled up at the counter. How's that again, Sonny? Short, you say? Short. And scalped on top with a fringe of hair like so? Yeah, and a wicked leer in his eye. That's my man. Well, he wasn't wearing no barrack hat nor plaid coat when I seen him. Salt and pepper suit it was. Yeah, I know. Who is he? Well, he didn't register, but they say he's Dowser. Dowser? Mm. Uh, don't know his first name, do you? Nope. Now, where he come from? Satan room six till two days ago. Ain't seen him around since. When did he come here? Eh, uh, let me see now. Uh, codfish balls. Beg pardon? Oh, that would be Friday night, late. Oh. The funny thing now, think of it, he'd come afoot. Not by the road from Fogarty Grove, mind you, but by the trail over the ridge. Oh, where does it go to, Aunt Charity? Winds up the old clobber place. Bandon now. Oh, thanks. I'll be back. You'll I... be nothing. You just sit right down where you are and you wrap yourself around this. Ain't no growing boy going hiking over the ridge without supper. Clean it up now, every scrap. Yes, Ma. <laughs> It had been dark about two hours when carrying one of Aunt Charity's best coal oil lanterns, I topped the ridge and looked down on Clem Clobber's abandoned barn, nestling in a grove of ancient oaks at the very foot of the hill. The moon was bright enough to show up the pair of grassy ruts leading from the rear of it down the gully toward the road to Fogarty Grove, a couple of miles away. On general principles, I blew out the lantern, then scrambled down the side hill and up to the barn door. I couldn't make out anything inside at first, and then finally something took shape. A dark hulk in the middle of the floor. Stupid me, I lit a match. It was an automobile. To be exact, it was Purse Snatcher's 1919 Winton 6. His hat and the tweed overcoat everyone saw him wearing Friday night were lying across the front seat. I held the match higher and bent over for a closer look. Whereupon Spade and the match went out together. <laughs> You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun for you Sunday with two of your favorite families, the Blandings and the Harrises. Mr. and Mrs. Blanding stars Cary Grant and Betsy Drake in the title roles as the proud but somewhat bewildered owners of the famous Dream House. The Phil Harris Alice Faye Show stars Phil and Alice, of course, plus ever-helpful Frankie Remley, Brother William, and Delivery Boy Julius. 
Yes, there are laughs this Sunday and every Sunday with the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show and Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. And now, back to the rowdy dowser caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I must apologize, Constable, for succumbing once again to the traditional nemesis of the private eye. But the bald facts are simply that I bent over for a closer look at the Wenton Six and was struck a dastardly blow on the rear of the head. How long I remained incommunicado, I know not. But I awoke presently, and with good reason. My pants were on fire. As a matter of fact, the entire barn was on fire, and I was lying in the tonneau of the Wenton Six wearing purse snatcher's overcoat. The door I'd come in was a wall of flame. Likewise, the stalls on both sides. But at the rear were a few square feet of rotten siding that hadn't caught yet. Now, ordinarily, I'd have thought twice, but when your pants are afire, you only think once. So I ran right through it and took a flying header into the creek behind the barn. It was just as well I only thought once, since at this moment, the flames reached the Winton's gas tank. Hi. Good laws almighty. What have you been up to, boy? Smoking corn silk behind Clobber's barn. Match got away from me. Well, stay right there till I find my goose grease. No, 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 no. Later, Aunt Charity. How about the key to six? The dowser fella? Yeah. Won't need no key, son. No door open? If he left it open, he's in there now. Barrett hat, plaid coat, and a 25-cent cigar. Help yourself. <laughs> Well. What, what? Hey, Mr. Spade, isn't it? Right, and you're Dowser. Mm. Dowser? Isn't it? Do- uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Dowser. Hey, you can call me Alonzo. Sit down. No, no, I'll stand. Oh? You're lucky you caught me. I was just... Just lo- leaving, so I see. I was detained, as you probably know, over at Clobber's barn. Detained? Okay, Dowser. We'll let that do for the preliminaries. Now, why'd you just try to kill me? Uh, kill you? Well, good heavens, man, I... I did not get careless at a weenie bake dowser. I just woke up in the middle of a three-alarm fire, and I don't like it. As a matter of fact, I'm a little burned up, to use the phrase loosely, and I just might kick your teeth in. Now, now, believe me, I haven't been near Clobber's barn since Friday. I had nothing to do with... with whatever happened. Sure, and you had nothing to do with a hundred-buck retainer in the phone call from Wendell Wisby. Well, as a matter of fact, You figured with a curious city fellow like me on the premises, urban route might shake down easier. Bigger apples from the same old tree, right? Yeah. All I did was negotiate a personal loan. Drop it, will you? Root had his hand on the till at the bank. A big hand, $53,000 worth. And Snatcher found out about it. What about you? How'd you get into the act? Uh, the loan. The shakedown. Where's Uncle Purse, Alonzo? Well, uh, out of town somewhere, I suppose. He... Uh, look, I can't tell you, Mr. Spade. Purse got as far as the road to Clem Clubber's barn last Friday night. Or did he? Uh, no. No, he didn't get that far. You know... I'd begun to suspect as much. How far did he get? I'm sorry, I can't tell you anymore. Root killed him, didn't he? No, no. You saw now, him? Let me go. How come? Uh, I don't know anymore. Please, come I on, let's have a dozer. What'd he do with the body? But, Root wore the coat and drove Purse's car out of town so everyone would see him. Now, where's the body? Let me go. Let me go. Dowser! Dowser! <laughs> He squirted out of my hands like a watermelon seed, leaving me with a plaid coat and took off down the line of Atomic Cabins toward the Atomic Restaurant. A nice high-knee action for a little guy. And what with my burns and contusions, I'm forced to admit he was widening the gap between us when he rounded the corner of the Atomic Restaurant, making possibly the gravest error of his career. Aunt Charity was rounding the same corner, coming the other way with an armload of wood. You don't reckon he got himself a brain conclusion, do you, son? I don't know, but he's a weak witness, Aunt Charity, a weak witness. What you got there? Oh, shoebox for $1,500. A <whistles> few odds and ends. And this. Well. Yeah, it looks like an oversized slingshot fork. Slingshot? What do you mean, slingshot? Well, who cares? So he whittles. Where'd you get the idea his name was Dowser? Huh? Driver's license in his wallet. Alonzo P. Scoggin. Who said his name was Dowser? You did. I never said his name was Dowser. I said he was a Dowser. Oh, oh. And uh, what's a Dowser, Aunt Charity? 
A guy who finds water for people, that's what. Well, that's nice. If you could... Finds water? Yeah. How? Well, I'm no expert, Sonny, but as near as I can recollect, you take this here slingshot for so, and then you... Mr. Spade, I, I can't go through with it. Get that. hold of yourself, Wendell. Remember the code of the wisdom. But this sinister revelation has virtually prostrated me, Mr. Spade. And you must remember, it is now over a year since my salad days as a magician. Tut, tut, Wendell. Stout fellow, stiff upper. And further, even at the peak of my career, I was only sketchily acquainted with the field of dowsery. Hold it. Hmm? There they are. Aunt Wistful is sitting on the back porch with President Root. Mr. Spade, I... The I... code of the Wisbees, Wendell? <sighs> yes, sir. Let's go. Tell you how full up of gratefulness I am. Now, now, Aunt Wistful, don't take on so. It's nothing at all. It's, uh... Uh, uh you remember Mr. Spade, President Root? Wait, wait, wait. Of course. Of I... course. Hardly seems any time at all since we met President Root. Oh, Mr. Spade, President Root's going to buy the farm. Isn't that wonderful? Touching. And he's allowing me 10000 on it mm-hmm. against the money per stove. Well, that's a generous offer. Yeah, I thought so. Considering there's no water on the farm. Oh, Pierce said many times it wouldn't be worth $40 an acre for that water. Well? Um, uh, did you say something, Wendell? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Aunt Wistful, I have great news for you. It may not be necessary to sell the farm. What do you mean, Wendell? We've made a deal here. Uh, maybe the signals are off for now, President Rood. You recall Uncle Purse said he'd found a man to solve his problem, Aunt Wistful? I am now ready to step forward and bring it into the open. I am that man. You? What do you mean, Wendell? Since entering the banking field, I divorced myself from magic and the allied dark arts, Aunt Wistful. So I wish to keep my other talent sub rosa. What are you talking about, Wisby? President Root... I am a part-time dowser. And he just happens to have his dowsing rod along, right, Wendell? Right. I have reason to believe there is water here, if I can just douse it out. Wendell, you're out of your... Shut up. Douse away, Wendell. Douse away. Very well. Now, I hold the dowsing fork before me. Thus. Mm -hmm. Then I turn. Thus. Where does it point, Wendell? Let me see. Toward Aunt Wistful's flower bed. This, this is ridiculous. Shut up. Proceed, Wendell. Proceed with the dowsery. One step, two, three, four. Well, the rod's five, pointing down. Oh, never. Right in the middle of my seven, flower bed. Hey, listen, Aunt Wistful. I'll make that twenty thousand. Twenty thousand dollars for the farm. Cash, see? Not credit. Cash. Twenty. Hold out. Uh, Twenty-five. Thirty. Uh, 30. Right here is where we did. Thirty-five. Thirty-five thousand. Well, it's already been dug up. Looks as if Uncle Purse had dug a hole and then filled it back up. Last Friday night, just before nine o'clock, right, President Root? <laughs> no, no. You came no, down no. for a showdown on those shortages he turned up. Found him digging the well here and got a better idea. <laughs> Please, no. I've talked to the guy who saw you do it, Root. All right. All right. I killed him. He's, he's right here. Yes, he's right here. <laughs> Which is where you came in, Constable, and since you can take it from here, I shall close, as always, with... Period. End of report. Right. Another triumph, Sam. Another new sphere of effort. No field is safe from my talent, sweetheart. You will please preserve it for posterity during the following 15-second announcement. Scoot. Scoot. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This Sunday, the glamorous and unpredictable Tallulah brings you another hour-and-a-half broadcast of The Big Show, starring Fred Allen, Judy Holliday, Joan Davis, Frank Warren, and many more. And this Sunday's Theater Guild on the Air production is the Broadway comedy, The First Year. Starring in this Theater Guild presentation are Richard Widmark and Catherine Grayson. Here it is, Sam. Ah, efficient girl. Yeah? Yeah, Millie, this is Sam, boy. What's up? Oh? Oh. Thanks, Millie. Well, 
What is it, Sam? They just relayed a message from Fogarty Grove, F. Wendell is being installed as second vice president tomorrow night at the Moose Hall. Oh? He wants me to come. Oh! And bring a girl. Are you game, little one? Well, that's one way to get the report to Constable Ollie Shuttle. <laughs> I'll do it, Sam. Good girl. Pack up an emergency ration of sorghum and hominy grits. I'll pull up at your doorstep in the morning at 8 o'clock. Well, I'll wear my sunbonnet and Mother Hubbard. <laughs> oh, good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn, Lorene Tuttle as Effie. Also in the cast were Peggy Weber, Verna Felton, Sidney Miller, Alice Wellman, Charles Smith, and Nestor Piva. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another Adventure with Sam Spade. Tomorrow, your hit parade plays the hit tunes on NBC. Welcome back. After the Denny Shane Keeper and the Civic Pride Keeper, two of the heavier and more serious episodes of the Dunn era, the series was due for something lighter. Uh, this week, we might have gotten a little bit of an overcorrection. Uh, this is a story with a lot of absurdities, you know, in terms of the names of characters, in terms of both the performances and the writing. Now, in some ways, I think this calls to mind some of the past Sam Spade scripts with Howard Duff, such as The Fairly Bright Caper from 1948. However, that was back when Gil Dowd and Bob Talman were writing the series, and they carried it off a little bit better. Uh, as it was, I think this had some points that definitely didn't hit, but I still enjoyed it for the most part, even though it was over the top. But your tolerance for absurdity in your detective shows may determine how much you enjoy this episode. The Radio Gold Index, usually, but not always, a straightforward log of cast and plots for various programs, had this note for writing credits for this episode. Harold Swanton, writer, who ought to be ashamed of himself. So definitely I expect some people not to be uh, quite amused by this episode. Well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to thank Dan. Dan's been one of our Patreon supporters since March 2016, currently supporting the podcast at the Detective Sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Dan. And that will do it for today. If you're enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. If you're enjoying the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. All those great things that help channels to grow. We'll be back next Monday with our final episode from the Steve Dunn run of Sam Spade. But join us back here tomorrow for the start of our next Yours Truly Johnny Dollar serial where... I did it the way any cub would have, only worse. I had a three o'clock deadline. I wanted to make it. I could have waited till the skipper came to, said Perling wasn't aboard. I could have contacted Perling's hotel, found out he was safely there. I didn't do any of that. I just phoned in my story. You know the rest. Every wire service in the country picked it up. Guess I was lucky I wasn't fired. Mm-hmm. You want another glass of beer? Mm, no. No, thanks. You've been pretty nice. I'm sure you're not all insurance investigator. Notice I haven't asked you exactly what you're investigating. Yeah, I noticed that. You gonna tell me? Possibly. Right now, something worries me. Uh, you were down at the landing when the boat caught fire. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. 
Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.